I was merely uh, someone who provided testimony and documentation. And this is for Alvin Bragg to make the case before the judge and the jury, if in fact that it gets that far, which I suspect that it will. Uh, at the end of the day, you're right. I wasn't watching today. I had some personal things to take care of that took me out of New York. Uh, obviously, as soon as I came back, I started to read all of the nonsense with um, the typical Donald Trump, uh, you know, rallies, despite the fact it was inside of Mar-a-Lago. It's the typical grievance, complaining, moaning and belly aching about how bad the industry, you know, how bad this country has been treating him. Yeah. One of the things that I thought was interesting uh, that you can speak about now that the indictment is public uh, comes in the statement of facts. Um, one of the criticisms of the potential case uh, against um, Donald Trump is not the misdemeanor charges of, of business fraud that that by all accounts, seems pretty solid. It's the question of whether or not this rises to become a felony, uh, which it does if these, this business fraud can be proven to have been done to hide other crimes. And the argument, although Mr. Bragg did not specify what those other crimes might be, the argument was it might have something to do um, with the uh, campaign election uh, financing and whether or not these were campaign contributions that you made uh, that David Pecker of the National Enquirer and its parent company made. And here's something interesting, because we were talking about this earlier, about whether or not Donald Trump could say, as John Edwards did, um, I wasn't trying to hide any of these uh, affairs from voters. I was just trying to hide it from my wife and my family. But twice in this document, right. you are cited. Um, once the defendant, Donald Trump, did not want the information about Karen McDougal, the affair with Karen McDougal, to become public because he, because he was concerned about the effect it could have on his candidacy. That's on page four of the statement. And then again, on page six, on the Stormy Daniels matter, Trump instructed you that if they could delay the payment until after the election, they could avoid paying altogether because at that point, it would not matter if the story became public. He's clearly, Mr. Bragg, based on your comments, based on your testimony under oath, making the argument that John, Donald Trump didn't care if Melania found out about this. This was all about hiding these affairs from voters. And I can promise you that Mr. Bragg and his qualified team will be providing a significant amount of documentary evidence that will corroborate all of the allegations or the statements that he has uh, in this document. And, but is that, is that not only your testimony before the grand jury, but also your, your view that you would say this evening, Donald Trump did this, ordered this. Uh, asked the, these payments, these hush money payments to be made because he wanted to keep this information from voters, not because yeah, he cared yeah, Jake, about keeping Jake, it from I, I, Jake, I apologize. Yeah, I apologize. I don't want to get into uh, what my future testimony or what the testimony that I provided to the grand jury. I stand by the statements of fact that exist in this document. Uh, and I assure you that Alvin Bragg will be able to provide the documentary evidence that he relied upon and he used in the drafting of this. The counts in the indictment involve incidents that took place, uh, including in 2017, when you were still in Donald Trump's circle, you had worked for him for many years. Can you just remind people when the relationship began to sour between you and Donald Trump? It was around the time uh, of the raid on my home in April. Yeah, and the, and the statement of fact in the indictment also talks about um, veiled threats that he was making towards you through, through social media. No, and he continues to do that. I mean, Donald has been uh, very consistent using his untruth social platform <laughs> in order to make these threats. He doesn't just make them against me. He makes them against anyone that he finds to be critical of him or that he has concern of it, whether it's Michael Cohen, whether it's Alvin Bragg, whether it's the judge, whether it's the prosecutors, whoever it might be that he deems to be a threat to him, uh, he uses whatever method that he has available to him in order to try to denigrate you and to harm you. Um, the indictment also talks about you discussing with then-President Trump 
uh, his need to repay you for the $130,000 paid to Stormy Daniels uh, as hush money, uh, a discussion that you had in the Oval Office of the White House. I don't know how you felt about it then, but looking back on it, is it weird that you were having that conversation in the Oval Office of the White House? Yeah, again, we're going into uh, conversations that may or may not have been uh, part of the grand jury testimony or my interviews with the um, prosecutors at the DA's office. So I'm going to sort of step aside from that. But yes, it would be um, it, it's not the sort of thing that you would expect uh, to take place inside of the Oval Office. <laughs> yeah, although certainly other things have happened near the Oval Office. Um, are you <laughs> that's, concerned that's also true. that this case could come down to who the jury finds more credible, you or Donald Trump, or is that a, a comparison you welcome? Well, it's definitely a comparison that I welcome. You know, one of the things that I consistently say, I hear on, you know, all the stations, including this one, uh, you know, we have to be concerned about Michael Cohen. He's a convicted perjurer. He's a convicted liar. Now, these are all great lines that Donald Trump has, uh, you know, has put out there for many people to continue to promote. What we, they need to do is to continue the sentence, which is the lie that I had provided to Congress which was done at the direction of, in coordination with, and for the benefit of Donald J. Trump. And if I could take it just another moment and remind your viewers what my big lie was about, it was about the number of times that I spoke to Donald about the failed Trump Tower Moscow real estate project. I was instructed to say three, when in fact the true answer was 10. And if that's the big lie that's going to prevent a jury from believing me in terms of, uh, you know, my credibility versus the guy who's lied to the American public over 35,000 times. That's fact checked, by the way. Um, you know, we'll see what happens. But I would I put my money on Cohen on this one. Well, one of the things that's so interesting about the um, <laughs> the Stormy Daniels hush money payment, I'm not a big reader of In Touch magazine, but apparently in 2011, Stormy Daniels was featured on the cover of In Touch magazine talking about her encounter, her sexual encounter with Donald Trump. Uh, this is obviously years before he announced he was running for president. Uh, if the fact, if it was already public, why pay her money to keep it quiet? Was it just because people didn't remember or didn't notice the first time it was on the cover of In Touch magazine? If it, it's either In Touch or In Style, you know, one, actually, one I, of those. I'm yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I don't recall that uh, specific uh, document uh, or that newspaper. Uh, during that time period, there was something else that had transpired where Stormy. Um, there was a story about Stormy Daniels and Donald Trump in a uh, online website called the Dirty dot com that ultimately was taken down. So I'm not sure about the article that you're referring to. What did you think of the indictment today? What did, what did you think of uh, the strength of the charges and the strength of the case, um, uh, given how much uh, you have invested uh, of your time uh, to, to, to bring these facts to light? Well, again, this is not Michael Cohen's case. This is an Alvin Bragg district attorney of New York case against the defendant, Donald J. Trump. I was merely asked to provide information, which I did. I provided not only testimony, I provided documentary evidence, something that I said going back to uh, when I had spoken with George Stephanopoulos and said that my loyalty belongs to my wife, my daughter, my son, and my country. And I believe that it's important that everyone who commits a crime be held accountable. And if those crimes were relevant enough by the Southern District of New York to hold against me, then certainly it should be, um, it shouldn't matter that it's Donald J. Trump or a former president or anyone. Now, this is up to Alvin Bragg and his uh, prosecutorial team to provide, um, you know, the information to, again, the judge and the jury at the appropriate time. In court today, Trump attorney uh, Todd Blanche, he defended uh, the former president's various statements on social media. Uh, which, as you know, um, many people have considered to be uh, beyond the pale uh, in terms of the names he's called individuals, including calling District Attorney Alvin Bragg an animal. 
Uh, he defended them by citing your podcasts, your other interviews that you've done in the run up to the case. <laughs> Perhaps this interview itself uh, will will be cited in the future. Um, what's your take on that? I'm not the defendant in this case. When I was the defendant in the case, Donald was very quick, along with his acolytes, to attack me on whatever platform that they had access to at the time. Uh, this is not Michael Cohen's not the defendant, Donald, you are. And so I will continue to speak truth to power. I will continue to provide uh, transparency to the American people so that they understand, to the extent that I can, uh, information that I have. And I don't care that they want to keep raising me. It's amazing how, once again, Donald is trying to shift all of the blame, which he's so good at. It's always somebody else's fault. Yeah, Michael Cohen is speaking on his podcast. Michael Cohen wrote a book. Michael Cohen wrote a second book. Therefore, he should be allowed to turn around and to say the things that he is saying against, again, the judge, the judge's family, uh, prosecutors, and so on. That's not the way the system works. And obviously, uh, Mr. Blanche should know that. Well, one last question for you. Just having been uh, in Trump world for so long, when he calls the general counsel, the special counsel, rather, Jack Smith, when he calls him a lunatic, uh, when he calls uh, the district attorney, Alvin Bra uh, district attorney Alvin Bragg, um, an animal, uh, when he criticizes uh, Alvin Bragg for being backed by George Soros, when he criticizes the judge uh, and the judge's daughter, is this just being pugilistic, just being a fighter? Is this just being uh, att attacking or it, does he actually want um, his supporters to go after these people, either rhetorically or even worse? Or I hate to say it, a combination of both. You know, he's always trying to show that he's strong. It's an appearance of strength. And he thinks by attacking people, whether it's a judge or the judge's daughter, myself or anybody, that this that this gives the appearance of strength. It doesn't. It actually gives the appearance of ignorance and stupidity. But nobody's able to tell him to knock it off because Donald Trump doesn't care what anybody says or what anybody thinks. He's going to continue to run the show the way he wants, which is why he has this clown car of of counsel right now representing him because no legitimate firm wants to take him on because you have an out of control client that doesn't listen to any advice and at the end of the day isn't going to pay you either. So, you know, this is you get you get what you pay for, I guess. One last question, Michael, <laughs> which is um, uh, Donald Trump and also a lot of his supporters in Congress and elsewhere uh, are constantly talking about uh, Alvin Bragg as being supported by George Soros, uh, who is a very wealthy progressive who funds a lot of uh, progressive uh, prosecutors, uh, clearly on the liberal end of the spectrum. Uh, George Soros is also somebody that uh, is a Holocaust survivor. He's Jewish. Uh, and a lot of anti-Semites also happen to criticize George Soros. I'm not saying criticizing George Soros is necessarily anti-Semitic. It isn't. But do you think the way that Donald Trump and his supporters invoke George Soros's name, does, does that bother you? Do you think they're doing it for any anti-Semitic reason? I do. I think it's an anti-Semitic trope, and I think Donald knows that, and that's why he continues to do it. Um, look, we've seen, we've seen Donald do things like this all the time. Every time that he refers, for example, to Alvin Bragg or to Fannie Willis uh, or to someone who's black, he calls them an animal. I mean, this is just the way that the man behaves. Um, there's no, again, it's why he's having such a difficult time in terms of getting competent counsel because he refuses to listen to anyone. He allows his worst nature to come forward and that's not going to help him in this case. You know, it's not just this case. He knows that there's the Georgia case, the Fannie Willis, the DA uh, case coming down the pike very soon. You have both of Jack Smith's case also. And this notion that, well, why did Alvin Bragg go first? What's the difference? Why all of a sudden are we treating this like it's a horse race? Who's coming in first, second, third, and fourth? It shouldn't matter. If you break the law, it's called accountability. And it goes right back to the adage that no one is above the law. And that includes Donald J. Trump.